We got other attention, everyone. Everyone, uh, we're, we're live on Zoom right now. We're live in the conference room here. Uh, welcome to the uh, 2020 annual general meeting. This will be the 45th year we've had this now. And, uh, you know, with a lot of stuff going on with COVID, we, you know, we're trying to provide masks for everyone and try to keep your distance. Um, what's new? What's going on in the credits? A lot. If you haven't noticed, we got a new building. We're uh, revamping it, getting it all ready. Uh, a lot of you have gone to the tours of both the existing building and the new building. Um, we'll be, uh, Mike McCauley will be coming in soon. We can talk to him a little bit about that. And Kristen Orm, she's doing with us at the uh, Cranks Institute. Uh, she's, oh, hi Kristen, how you doing? Hi Mike, <laughs> just talking about you guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we're just talking about uh, all the new things, all the wonderful things that's been going on at the building. And uh, if you wanna, Michael, if you wanna, uh, Tell us some of your uh, great stuff. <laughs> 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 All right. I'll give it a shot. Yeah, just a, just a quickie about yeah. all the good stuff you've been yep. doing. All right. Uh, I'm Mike McCauley, if anybody doesn't know me. I've been here about three and a half years, and I'm basically what you call a facility technician, kind of take care of. Uh, on-site stuff of both the buildings and Dennis just kind of wanted me to give you a little bit of what we've been doing uh, as far as getting the other building which we're kind of calling CI West um, just two doors down from our main building and we've been working on the interior of the building because it was in pretty bad shape uh, we currently have rectified that it's been all repainted uh, the ceiling's been all repainted and cleaned uh, the floors were just epoxy and cleaned, and that makes it much easier on my job for maintaining, keeping clean, not only for ease of that, but when you walk in, it makes the facility look a little bit better, a little more presentable for people. Uh, as your members, I think everybody likes that. So uh, we've put in new cement work on the outside of the new building because the cement was uh, so bad that you couldn't even pull into the interior of the building with the semis that bring the tanks to us. And also when we go to get a storage bulk tank in the back, when we do get it installed, filled. So we have a pad that was put in also. So we are removing the 3,000 gallon storage tank from our main building down to the new facility. And we have a new 6,000 gallon storage bulk tank for the main building and we have all the stainless steel piping on order that is uh, in PO now. Uh, the new storage bulk tank has been ordered and uh, unfortunately they're backed up so that may not be till January, February, but by then we're hoping to have uh, the catwalks built and in place. We can get a micro bulk tank in if we need to use the tanks that we have there now so there should be an issue with that uh, we have enough room for probably another nine patients at our current facility so that should be able to get us into next year we're hoping but we will be ready for them um, other than that a few other things we're getting some of the water issues from drainage off the building when it rains on the side of the building we're having drainage system put in um, other than that that's about it so when people see where your money's going, we hope if anybody had the time to come down and look at the new building, uh, hope you, you're, you know, you're happy with what we've done there, uh, the ongoing progress there and everything like that. So uh, your money's getting put to good use. So uh, any other questions you got, you can ask me. Right, right. Yeah. I didn't tell the story about painting that much. The yeah. Inside. No, I'm saying what you guys did to avoid the big number. Yeah. What's okay, so thing? anyways, uh, the, the company that owned that building we purchased it from is a, a company located across the street from much which is called KTEC. They are a high performance engine building company. They own the building that we currently own, the new building. Uh, they had machine shops set up in there. They were doing dyno testing. So a lot of the facility was just blackened, trash. There was problems with the roof being blown off before the roof was replaced. There was mold issues in the wall, so I had to go in and have the entire interior. I 
hand scraped all the walls myself, primed all the walls, I painted the whole interior, ceiling, all the side walls, and got that taken care of. The quotes we were getting for the exterior of the building was about $35,000. So last summer, Andy and I took on a project ourselves to scrape both buildings by hand, and we painted both buildings ourselves at a cost of so the material cost was only about $2,000, so we saved approximately $33,000. So, um, yeah. So that's the type of stuff we would like to do. When Andy and I can do that, we do that. There are certain things that we can do, cement work, piping, and stuff like that. We do have to hire and have companies come in and do the professionals so we can't can, you know, take up some of that cost. So whatever Andy and I are trying to do, we can do whatever is above us we're passing on so uh hopefully everybody likes it thank you all right yep. Have a great yeah. i can certainly say thank you uh you've been doing a fantastic job you guys are working so hard out there uh one more time everyone for mike Yeah, and it's not here, but yes, everyone appreciates all the hard work you guys as well. Brings me to our third, a new employee, uh, Christy Orm. Uh, waves, will you just stand up, honey, and wave to everyone? Okay. So, uh, Kristen is a uh, funeral director, and she also does a lot of her secretary work and perfusion work. Uh, she's from Trenton, Michigan. She lived in Michigan her entire life, has two daughters in their 20s. She went to Wayne County Community College and graduated summa cum laude and with an associate degree, then graduated from uh, Wayne State University with a Bachelor in Science, specializing in mortuary science. Has been a licensed mortician for over 10 years. Uh, she does the body perfusions at CI, along with the secretarial work, the contracts, the checking of nitrogen levels, and she's happy to work here and help people's uh, dreams for the future come true. So let's give a round of hand. That brings me, uh, so that's what's going on with our building projects and our new employee. And uh, we're still working uh, with our old employee, Hillary um, Martin. Yes. Yeah. That's her new, her new name now. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so we still do uh, contract work with her along with uh, James Walsh through our homes. So we try to keep our options open and uh, levels of redundancy. Um, and then uh, what's going on in research, hopefully uh, we can uh, hook up uh, and get um, David Edinger to talk about uh, the beautiful donation that him and Connie made to Adam Higgins, Professor Adam Higgins is doing work in uh, cryogenic solutions and, and protectants. Uh, so maybe they will hook up and they can talk about that. But anyways, we're us to our election. Um, so this is the following uh, current election results, starting with uh, Shannon Blevins, we have 24 votes. Uh, Connie Edinger, we have 105 votes that uh, allows her to keep her seat as a um, incumbent official. Uh, we also have Paul Hagen with his 67 votes, which uh, allows him to retain his incumbency. Uh, Joe Kowalski with 121 votes. Congratulations, Joe. Uh, Pat Heller with 77 votes. So the four incumbents um, are were, uh, not unseated. We have uh, Nicholas Lacombe with 55 votes and Arthur Zachariah with 39 votes. Um, congratulations to the, um, the current directors. And I would also like to say thank you to the guys who are throwing their names into the hat and giving it a shot. You know, it's not just about winning these elections, also, a lot of these, a lot of the people. Um, volunteer and put in time and efforts. I know Shannon's been doing a lot with social media, Facebook, YouTube, all kinds of stuff. Um, 
we got Doug here, who's not even a member, and he's been doing tons of volunteer work for us and helping us out in a lot of ways. A lot of our members know about software engineering that helped us with our phone apps and other equipment. And so just because you're, you don't get elected doesn't mean you can't help out and help the organization because we're all in this together. It's not about the self, it's about the whole organization and our dream for the future. So congratulations. Um, so that brings me to my first speaker. Um, my first speaker is going to be Pat Heller, and he's going to be talking about uh, past and present and uh, future finances at the Cranics Institute. Pat is a certified uh, public accountant, and he owns a rare coin business. And precious, he deals with rare coins and precious metals. He's the owner of chief executive of Liberty Coin Services in Lansing. He became the treasurer of CI in 1980 and has also uh, served as <coughs> vice president at CI. He took office uh, as vice president in 1995. And uh, welcome aboard. Well, thank you, Dennis. I, uh, I was the owner of Liberty Coin Service for forever, but I, I sold it six and a half years ago. And I still work there. Uh, I'm down to about 30 hours a week. Uh, I'm just a communications officer now. Uh, can I get a uh, maybe multiple volunteers to distribute the uh, treasurer's report and some financial documents here? Uh, everybody gets uh, one of these. One of each, or are they the same? Are they the same? Um, like each uh, bag has all the same item in it. Oh, okay. Everybody gets one from each bag. Okay. <laughs> and this uh, year, uh, we have uh, possibly the best financial news uh, in uh, Cranix Institute's history. Uh, if we could get that a slide there. Uh, the 12 month period from July 1, 2020 to June 30. 2021, but the most successful ever for Cranks Institute. Revenues exceeded expenses in that 12 month period by almost two and a quarter million dollars. Uh, in addition to that, there was 156,000 in new memberships and 531,000 in bequests, which go to contributed capital. They don't go through the income statement. Uh, the majority of the uh, increase in revenues over expenses was at 87.7% uh, of that was from investment gains, which will be discussed a little bit further uh, by Steve Likes. Uh, Cranic services revenue during that 12 month period were $741,000, which is also the highest for any 12 month period in Cranic Institute history. And I understand that uh, since then, there's been even more new patients coming in since the end of June, so that trend seems to be continuing. So the uh, Cranic Services income in that 12-month period exceeded all operating expenses by $123,000. And over the 45-year history of Cranic Institute, you rarely have a 12-month period where Cranic's revenues cover all of operating expenses, so that's wonderful news. But in addition to Cranix revenues, the organization also received $151,000 of dividend and in interest income. Now, as good as that news is, you also have to keep in mind that investments have not been stable over the history of the Cranix Institute, as exactly as the economy as a whole. So it is a good idea to take a look at well, what happened from January to June 2020. And I have uh, prepared a uh, comparison of the last three, six months period. Because uh, in the uh, January to June 2020 period, the investment losses, well, the uh, organization lost over $714,000 of which 93.4% of that loss was from investment losses. 
So you can have wonderful news in a short time period uh, from investment gains, but you can also have that followed shortly thereafter by significant investment losses. Uh, because of that, in my mind, it makes sense for the Cranix Institute Finances to assume a volatile investment market so that uh, you do not depend on investment gains for financing the operations. Uh, instead, if the operations can be covered by chronic services, revenues, and dividends and interest, uh, that would lead to a stable organization. And that certainly has been the case uh, for the last 18 months. Uh, the documents being passed around are the December 31, 2020 uh, annual financial statements, and then the June 30, 2021, six months financial statements, and then a copy of this 18-month uh, uh, analysis and my notes here. And on the uh, uh, three six-month period, I did a projection for what could happen for the full uh, 12 months of 2020, and in that, uh, the uh, assuming that in the second half of the year, all the investment gains from the first six months uh, are completely offset and wiped out to zero, the organization is still likely to have more revenues in, uh, in excess of operating expenses for the full year. Because of recent investment gains, Granite Institute now has in patient care assets more than $31,000 per human patient. Uh, the, uh, for the uh, 18 months period, uh, January 2020 to June 23, the dividend and interest, come, interest income from all investments only averaged a, a yield of about 1.7%. Uh, but if you have $31,000 per human patient earning 1.7% a year, that's only about $530 of income. And that's not enough to cover uh, patient care expenses. Uh, in 1976, the original contract assumed that all labor would be performed by volunteer labor. The cryogen cost would be about $1,000 a year. Uh, that the cryostat capital cost would be about $5,000 per patient. And there would be other preparation costs of about $3,000 per patient. So of the $28,000 contract price, $8,000 would cover initial expenses and capital equipment. And then the idea was that the other 20,000 would in effect be an endowment that at a 5% uh, rate of return could cover, uh, could generate $1,000 of income to cover the cryogen's cost. Uh, the good news is that the cryogen's cost has gone down. It's now less than $300 per patient per year. Uh, but at a 1.7% return on investments, uh, ignoring investment gains or losses, that's still not enough to cover the other expenses because the Cranix Institute now has a uh, payroll cost of about $1,000 per human patient per year, which was not figured into the original cost. Uh, also, the Cryostat costs uh, have gone up just like just about every kind of goods and services. Uh, the latest uh, ones purchased, uh, it's costing about $6,200 per patient uh, for the cryostats. And that's almost certain to keep going up. So that's over the 5,000 capital cost. Uh, plus you have patient preparation costs of about $2,000 uh, which includes uh, some amount for mortician services. Uh, so the issue of the pricing of the Cranix Institute 
uh, for future members and patients is something the board of directors is going to need to discuss. Uh, one uh, attractive point of the Cranix Institute is being able to offer a contract for $28,000 I think it may still be possible to offer that, but perhaps, uh, well, certainly those who already have signed contracts, your price is fixed, you're grandfathered in. But the it may be possible to say, we will offer the 28,000 price in the future, but only for new members who uh, fully fund their contract or prepay their contract within six or 12 months of joining CI. Uh, but the other contract prices may go up, and that's just what's happening in the world. Uh, as of June 30, 2021, CI's checking account uh, balance was enough to cover about nine months of operating expenses, assuming no funds coming in from new memberships, bequests, or cranic services, or no dividends and interest. So the uh, Cranix Institute uh, is in very good shape. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd appreciate that. Pat, can you hear me over the computer? Yes. Uh, my, my question or questions relates to long-term financial health. I need a chair. Of, uh, Let me get your chair. And, and I look at this, and you were here a couple of years ago as well. Have you considered having audited financial statements? Maybe. Because, you know, again, everyone here is looking at something, you know, obviously a very long-term investment. And, you know, these are clearly not audited. These aren't even in conformity with the accounting practices. And I think everybody would like to, to know um, from a third-party independent source that Cryotic Institute is, is financially viable. And have you considered that? Uh, the question asked is, uh, should the Cranix Institute consider having audited financial statements, uh, which is a, uh, regarded as being a better protection for the members and for any third parties? Uh, that's certainly a question worth considering. Uh, I think it would be a fair question for the Board of Directors to discuss. Uh, that is something that would have a cost to it. Uh, my guess is it may cost about five to ten thousand dollars annually to do so. Uh, the Granix Institute at June 30th had 11 million dollars in assets. Now it may now be large enough that that's a really good question. Uh, we do have uh, outside uh, accountants doing the tax work. Uh, the annual financial or tax reports for the organization, and those are costing I think around five to six thousand dollars a year, uh, which, uh, because of all the investment work, uh, is rather complicated. But uh, uh, you raised a good question, and I think it's certainly worth uh, being discussed by the board of directors. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other questions? Uh, if you do have any other, uh, oh, one more, yes. Question about um, so understanding the asset mix of our uh, investments, um, like the stock bond ratio, or, um, where do we find more details about that? Um, you, yeah, you'll get more of that in the discussion of investments with Steve Blake. And again, that, that just goes back to having audited financial statements or something where you would have all of that detail so you could understand what was really going on. And any other questions? Our next speaker, uh, Steve Loitz, was born in Detroit, Michigan, uh, the fifth of six children. He graduated from Michigan State in 1986 with a BA in Logistics and a Master's Degree in Finance a few years later. His professional career includes Kraft Foods, Chrysler Daimler, uh, Chrysler Financial, and in 2009, he became president of a joint venture between ADP and Reynolds. 
He first became interested in cranics when a neighbor friend was an uh, important influence in his life introduced the topic. He has been one of the longest serving board members dating back 25 years and has attended every annual meeting since 1988. Steve also maintains his license as a registered representative and continues to dabble in financial planning. He has been generous with his insights and experience as a member of CI's investment committee and makes inside audits of CI's financial accounting practices. He continues to reside in Michigan with his wife and three children, and over the last 20 years has become an avid runner. In other words, uh, in other words, I do uh, whatever Dennis asked me to do. So he asked me to come with some prepared remarks, and I apologize. This is going to be a little bit of an eye chart uh, if you're not on Zoom, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll fumble through this anyway. Uh, okay, so I like to follow Dennis. Some of you have heard me year after year uh, because, uh, or not as much Dennis, but Pat. Pat being a CPA, it sounds like we may have another CPA or two in the room, uh, but uh, CPAs speak a, a very different language. You know, you can tell the difference between a finance guy and a CPA. So uh, CPAs show pennies on their million dollar schedules. Finance guys just round it to the nearest thousand. So that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's what you can tell. Uh, so if you, uh, I've heard a lot of balance sheets over the years uh, and uh, I, I, would, I would say ours is stable uh, and, and solid. Uh, and I think, I think that's, you know, so you can, you can read through all that. Um, it's, a, it, it's a good picture. Uh, if, whenever you're looking at, uh, you know, Pat shows in uh, different multiple columns, just stay on the uh, balance sheet, stay focused on the right-hand side uh, where, you, where you see the combined asset totals. Uh, we have to separate them for uh, accounting purposes. But here's really all you need to know. We own our land and building, even the new building, right? It might all the painting work we did, right? All that, all that is on our balance sheet, free and clear. Uh, it, it's, it's undervalued because of the sweat equity that we put in the old building, the new building. Uh, the, the buildings get depreciated. Land doesn't, but the building does. And they're worth far more than what's even shown on the, on the balance sheet. The next large item is cry cryostats. These things are going to probably last for 70 years. We depreciate them over seven years. Uh, so it shows up as a large expense. That, that expense is actually e exaggerated. Uh, Cash is out of the bank, but uh, the value is, uh, is is greater than what's on the books. But you, you're looking at uh, you know our, our investment portfolios that have almost eclipsed a ten million dollar mark. Uh, that that is substantial. Uh, we uh, Pat shows the prepaid um, as as a um, as a liability because those are refundable. Uh, but in in effect, uh, we earn the interest uh, from those. Those are those are. Uh, Separated, and we, we just basically buy uh, very conservative interest-bearing uh, investments from those from those funds in case there's a, a call on CI, so to speak. Uh, on, on the income statement side, predictable with, with prudent cost control. I look at them every month. I would I would tell you know for, for uh, Pat published them or, or Pat uh, or Andy published them every month. They really they're, you really can ignore the monthly. You need to look at a longer time period six months, 12 months, much like uh, Pat had, had, had described. We're basically operating at break even or better, uh, even on, on most months, month over month. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly, if you look over a six or 12 month period, we're at break even or better. Our, our, our break even point, it, it, um, if you really uh, drill down, it's about, you know, if, we, if we try to preserve one human and a, a pet or two, we basically break even from a from a cash flow standpoint. Those are, and you can see, you can run your, your numbers. You know, our highest cost is a personnel cost, which is relatively low, quite frankly. Uh, but that's thirty five percent of our of our uh, cash flow is uh, our expenses, our personnel, and then cryo uh, related expenses and facility, which is the majority of it is depreciation. Uh, and that, that's from this is this is all from accounting, not not a tax perspective. Tax is slightly different. Uh, and it, uh, yes, sir. Doug? Just, what's included in the cryo expenses? Would be mostly the uh, 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 cryo, the uh, um, liquid nitrogen. Okay, yeah, that's that's the majority. Utilities. Yeah, 
utilities, right? Uh, and then, and then if you if if we can generate uh, about two percent uh, on our investment income, that that pretty much ensures we're a break-even organization. So you can see that the nest egg that we have we have built over the years really has has allowed us to to operate not only at break even but better, and has really put us in a, in a strong financial position. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the investments. So four years ago, uh, we changed our investment approach a bit. Uh, we, there was a, a handful of us on the finance committee, each of us would pick our paper funds. Some of them are still in our portfolio, but most of those have all been, have all been uh, uh, invested into two different approaches. Uh, we have an uh, unmanaged, and this is the, the majority of our funds are in the unmanaged. It's, it's heavily weighted towards equity markets. I'll show you the allocation here in a minute. Uh, we use you know zero cost Vanguard funds. Those are obviously doing well. Joe Kowalski, who I, uh, who often speaks here, uh, I'm not sure if he'll be speaking today or not, but uh, he's a full time professional. He's a CI board member, just reelected. Uh, his tour, he does this as, uh, for a living. I don't I don't do it uh, for a living, uh, but uh, his his investments I'll show you are, are heavily weighted uh, on the equity side too, and his recent performance has been has been, has been strong. So, like I said, the MH funds uh, has, has really has, has outperformed uh, Joe for the first three years. Although in the last year, Joe has really made a strong showing, and uh, I'll show you. I, I have a chart on that. So, uh, a bit of an eye chart. But, you know, I'll, I'll read it, the the highlights here. Uh, it's mostly it's mostly equities, mostly domestic equities. Seventy eight percent stocks, seven uh, percent bonds. 15% short-term reserves, and you can see, you know, 78% domestic, and you know, with the with the, the, the balance are being international. 7% uh, in the bonds, mostly domestic. There, uh, this is our, our unmanaged uh, allocation, and you can see our cost 0 0.06 basis points. So that, that's like nothing. Uh, that's that's as low that's as low as you're going to get uh, if, if we were to go to a professional. That would be two decimal places to the left of uh, one point something percent is, is, uh, is typical what you see from uh, full-time you know financial planners but uh, we're we're very low uh, going through Vanguard and, and just uh, we play but we play the long game uh, this is our, our largest holding of the on the uh, unmanaged just wanted to drill down here it's the Vanguard total stock market index just to give you a little bit of a flavor here uh, if you look you know, we've been in this, uh, you know, somewhere between three and five years. Ironically, it's about uh, just a hair under 18% return. Uh, and, and you can, what's interesting here too is uh, our net asset value returns and our market returns are about the same. The, the, uh, the fees are so low, it's, it's incredible. It would, and you would expect it to match the, the benchmarks being such a, a large uh, stock portfolio. Uh, you would expect it to match the benchmarks and minus the, you know, a few basis points. Here's a, it, it, the, a last, last two year view, going back to 2000, or, or actually five year view, uh, almost five year when we went back, when we started moving all the funds from, like I said, the half a dozen of us collectively put our, our best wisdom together and, and uh, Ben Best was on the, on the committee, right? We would, we would all pick our, our funds and, and uh, pro rata allocation. We changed that, went mostly to unmanaged uh, and and uh, it took us a, a few months to move everything over, but you can see the blue growth and the dip in the dip uh, yeah, during I call the pandemic plunge. Actually, even have a better picture, but you know steady growth uh, throughout throughout the years. This is the two year view, and I captured uh, what I call it again the pandemic plunge. And uh, we're well back here. We gave up. We, we gave up. We gave up all the gains that we had the prior three years, and you can see it. It actually dipped down to you know. Uh, we were we were down a half a million dollar from the from the start of this two million uh, uh, two year period, uh, but uh, we decided you know we decided that we're in it for the long run and we're not gonna, we're not going to sell. We didn't we didn't sell anything. Matter of fact, we we, we bought was, it, if we have extra cash around, we we continue to uh, move money into the unmanaged fund and. Uh, it's really done well, obviously. I think over this uh, five year period, it's a little over 12% uh, increase, and obviously, it's significantly more if you just look at the uh, remarkable two year run that we've had. So, very, very strong performance there. Uh, so, we have all kinds of line of sight and detail. If you know, if, if whoever wants to uh, take a look, 
So I'm not a formal auditor, uh, but I, 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 uh, I do from time to time uh, look at the financial statements, look at the investments to make sure that, they're, that the money's really there. These are, these are segregated funds. Uh, and I can attest for what it's worth that uh, these are, these are uh, true, finan this is a true financial picture and, and these funds uh, exist. Uh, uh, but but if you want to if you want to drill, drill down uh, and, and and look at performance and, and allocations to a more to a more detailed level, obviously you can you can uh, get a hold of me and we can do that. And you can do the same with Joe. And I'll speak for Joe. I think we're having trouble with uh, Zoom here. Uh, that's uh, uh, Joe's uh, phone number. So feel free to reach out to Joe, and he can he can uh, describe his. Uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to go through the me methodology. I'll talk a little bit about his performance, uh, but uh, he can he'll go through his methodology, which is which is quite interesting. Uh, he, he's uh, he, he's buying a lot of puts and calls, covered uncovered. Uh, it's uh, it's an interesting methodology, and uh, recently it's really it's really done well. So it, looking back over the over the four and a half, this is his allocation, mostly domestic stocks as well. Uh, um, uh, looking back at the four and a half year track record, it's uh, it, it's it's he's underperformed the S and P in the in the uh, the bond index on an annualized basis. Uh, so, uh, but about a, a little over a year ago, and Joe may make some more comments. He uh, he made some changes in, in how he was allocating his funds, and you can see in the last uh, I think this is a uh, August to August period, uh, it, it's covered up though, but he was up 70, 80%, uh, where the S&P, if you use that as a benchmark, was up 28%. So 60, 70, almost 80% in, in a couple of these. So he, uh, he really has come back strong and he's closed the annualized gap quite a bit. Uh, we also we also invest, it's, it's unusual investment, and I won't go into a lot of details, some annuities. Uh, and, and these annuities we hold obviously long term, and there's certain individuals that are, that are named in those. Uh, uh, obviously, the, the company owns them, but they're they're based on individual lives, and so those have done those have done quite well uh, uh, over the same period of time, obviously, and, and have higher death benefits than even these ending values indicate. So uh, small allocations, fifty thousand, ninety thousand. You know, sixty thousand. So smaller allocations, but uh, a, a unique twist on, on what you wouldn't typically see in this investment portfolio. And again, if you want to go a little bit deeper on how Joe uh, uses uses annuities, uh, uh, feel free to give him a call. I, I wanted to follow up one more topic. Uh, Pat, Pat opened the door a little bit, so I had a, I had a prepared slide in here, and uh, there's been a lot of conversation. Uh, uh, concern over the years about our prices, and uh, I think it was a little less than two years ago, late 2019, we did raise the postmortem uh, price to 35,000 from 28,000, and we also raised the annual um, annual membership to 35,000. So if you don't if you don't pay your 1250 up front, uh, then you, you you pay uh, I think 100 bucks, uh, 120 something like that over uh, uh, yearly. Your price is thirty-five thousand. So we raise that as a, as a test to, to to see how how that might work out, and it's actually worked. Uh, it's worked well. Lifetime and prepaid memberships re, um, remain at twenty-eight thousand, and uh, and uh, pet suspensions are you know in, in the thousand dollar range. But what I, uh, I I compiled some notes on what I think are the, the positives, uh, if I could say that, uh, on our current pricing and, and our, our, our our overall financial well-being. No debt balance sheet, as I said before. You know, ten million dollars in investments. We're operating it to break even or better. Uh, minimum minimum tax uh, because we're just barely break even. There's not there's not a, a high tax burden on our on our earnings. Uh, we've achieved economies of scale uh, thanks to Andy, thanks to Mike. Uh, historical volunteer staff has really limited our HR expense. Uh, and and uh, the other point here, so far so good on, on two of the four price increases. Above, uh, we've, we've been able to uh, raise the, from 28 to 35, and Andy reports that that, that, that is uh, uh, working out well. Historically, we've received uh, very generous requests, some overfunding. It's really been a major factor in our in our financial strength. Pet suspensions are, are highly profitable. Uh, I don't think that was part of the original uh, business case. 
and the historically low uh, prices are really has, bottom line has really worked out well for us. Now, the, the additional commentary, uh, you know, people say, well, why haven't you raised prices? You've got, have kept it always the same. And it's, it's nice it's nice to be the lowest cost producer in the market. But there's, a, uh, for those of you who study economics, you've heard of price elasticity. And um, that, that's always been a concern. Basically, price elasticity says if you raise the price by, you know, 10%, uh, if you lose 20% of your customers, you just went backwards. And, and, and so what we've proven here, though, at least anecdotally, is that is that uh, when we raise from 28 to 35 for the for the for the two uh, components above there, uh, we probably didn't lose um, a new patient. So that's a that, that, that's a positive that's a, that's a positive outcome. Uh, my financial model analysis projections really are based on higher cost. Uh, as I look into, the, as I've studied this and looked into the future, you really you can't rely on volunteer services long term forever. So I factored in, you know, higher higher HR costs. Uh, conservatively, we can't count on you know equal rates of request and overfunding. Although those probably will continue, uh, you, you, you need to tweak those down in, in your financial modeling. Uh, and really, my bottom line is that there's no dire need to raise prices. Uh, this is subjective. Uh, so this isn't the statement of the board. This is just you know, a, a my view, uh, but uh, I, I don't see any dire need. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I agree with Pat, and it's uh, it's time for the board to have further discussions on the matter, given given the you know the price pressures that we're all seeing in the marketplace today. So, real quick, yes, sir. Uh, on, on the, you know, the quest over funding um, is what is the overfunding? I get the request. Yeah, so uh, Doug asked me that. Is it Doug? No. David. David. He looks like Doug. <laughs> David. Uh, overfunding is so it, it, instead of paying 28000 a lot of people get uh, buy life insurance, 50000 life insurance, and, and, and allocate all of it to CI. It would be so you're not to book it as a debt, a prepay. Correct. We do not book it as a prepay. Because right. those are those are you know they just they just they just indicated who, who the beneficiary is of the of the insurance policy, Very not good. the owner. Very good. Yeah. Yes, sir. Steve, I wanted to make sure the board was aware of one other situation when you're thinking about price increase. And I think you correctly noted uh, elasticity is one of those yeah. features. The other, to me, is where are we on what is likely an exponential curve? regarding additional demand um, as we go into the future. We're seeing this already in the last couple of years where we've gone from a lower number of people becoming patients per year to a much higher number now. And the question is, does that explode to an even higher number in the next few years? Will it become socially more acceptable? Things of that nature. And you've got to be very careful in terms of where that price increase goes in at that part of the demand curve. Because if you choke off that social acceptance that's moving forward, you, you may give some people an excuse to say, well, yeah, not only is it kind of, you know, the ew factor that I'm getting over and, you know, having to tell my family and, and working through all those conversations, but now all of a sudden they raise the prices. Um, that can create some kinds of, of, of disconnect there, which might actually hurt us instead of helping. <coughs> Those are good comments. It wasn't a question. I, I wish I handed in the microphone. I'm not sure I could paraphrase that, but I think you know a, a, a few of the board members heard you. And you're exactly right. You know that that uh, if, if if we're if we're too greedy and we and, and we push the push the price, it just becomes that much more of a hurdle for new members to justify and to sell to their greedy family members. To, to put them up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Who's next? Uh, got uh, Joe Kowalski coming up. I can do the introduction. Can we get Joe working? Let's see if we get the sound on this. <laughs> so um, next will be uh, Joe Kowalski. He'll be talking about the crowd prize that he might uh, touch on a little bit of uh, his active investing. Uh, Joe Kowalski was born and raised in the Detroit area. Both of his parents are teachers, a fact that he feels encouraged his own lifelong love of learning. He became aware of practice when his uncle gave him an article and then asked 
his seventh grade teacher for more information, uh, given only after parental approval, Joe was hooked. For the next 15 years, Joe kept abreast of the movement, eventually becoming associate member of the Immortal Society. He still remembers attending meetings at David County Manager's house and speaking to Violet Sheriff, a man he looked up to as a hero. Uh, Joe has a BA in economics um, from Wayne State University, was visiting a uh, student at Columbia University, and has a JD from University of Michigan Law School. He became a member of the Maryland uh, DC and Michigan Bar Association. Uh, Joe clerked for Antitrust Division of the Federal Trade Commission in Washington, DC, worked for uh, US Senator Carl Levin on Capitol Hill, and uh, the President uh, Clinton presidential transition team. After two months of volunteer work in Australia and New Zealand, Joe returned to Michigan, where the guidance of former Congressman Bill Broadhead and uh, loving assistance of his parents and sisters, he established a law practice and clinic as a nonprofit tomorrow incorporated, uh, focused on helping uh, those with lower incomes for uh, charging sliding scale fees. In 1999, he left the law firm field to become a financial consultant for one of the large investment houses. Following that interest uh, that he had had since he was 15, he started his own financial company in 2010. He currently manages approximately $30 million in client assets. While well, assisting CIA in legal work related to the suspension of um, when Joe was practicing attorney, he decided to finally get his big work in order, and as Bob Abbott just said, joined CI and became elected as director in short order. Joe was vice president from 2001 to 2003. Please welcome Joe. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, I'm going to put on my PowerPoint, so give me just a second. Let me make sure you can see it. Uh, screen three. And hopefully you can see my PowerPoint because I have lost, I've lost my, uh, my feed to the, to the uh, notes from you guys. So I'm hoping that you guys can see this. It says I'm screen sharing. Can somebody... Maybe text me and, and confirm that you're getting my screen share. All right, maybe not. Well, as long as you can hear me. Yes, we are receiving it. You got it. Thank you very much, Aaron. All right, so here we go. Um, you already know who I am. I've been on the board of CI for over 25 years. I've been involved for over 40 years. Uh, I am today actually a guest speaker at CI for the Oregon Crowd Preservation Prize, which is sponsored by the Immortalist Society, which is actually a different organization entirely and will have its meeting later today. So I want to thank Cranix Institute for giving me the opportunity to talk about the Cryo Prize. Um, everyone that I have asked over the past seven years knows someone who had or needs an organ transplant or knows someone who knows someone who has, excuse me, everyone but one that I have asked. One person did not. But... Um, and, and I ask you to think about that. If you folks know uh, anybody that, and oh, I'm going to take a look and see if I can see the, uh, see the chat. No, no way for me to see the chat. Um, so I'm going to ask if you guys know anybody. There we go. I got the chat back. Uh, if you guys know anybody uh, that has or had or needs an organ transplant, because I got to tell you, people are very enthusiastic about this. And what you might not know is well okay chris you're you're number two um what you might not know is that currently we have enough of most donated organs but we lose a dramatic number of organs up to 80 percent of some donated organs are never implanted into a recipient if we were able to freeze or actually vitrify these organs we could have more time it would be less costly and we can make organ transplants more available i hope that your friend gets them connie um, I want to thank everyone at the Immortalist Society for your hard work and support. 
you know, I'm confident that cryonics is going to work. I've said this many times before. It's a matter of copying nature. This wood frog that you see on the screen, he actually freezes in wintertime. His brain stops, his lungs stop, his heart stops, and they restart in the proper sequence to work. The nematode, a small worm, basically, um, has been frozen and its memory has been retained. It's been taught to travel through a maze and it, can, it retains its memory after being defrosted. Tardigrades, water bears, very hardy little guys. Uh, these guys also have uh, been frozen, uh, and not just for a short period of time. They've been frozen for as long as 30 years, and they've been revived and, um, and, and live a normal life, even uh, very young. So there's an animated picture of a water bear, a little prettier. What about people? Well, uh, this guy was dead for about 12 hours in Pennsylvania, and they warmed him up, and he's doing okay. As Dennis says, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. And I guess that's said by paramedics and doctors uh, in general. So there's a lot, a lot in nature that we just need to figure out and copy. And we've been pretty good at copying nature, even though some of our most prominent scientists didn't think that we'd be able to do so. I know a lot of people involved in cryonics are not terribly religious. I grew up in a religious environment, so I want to address that because historically some religious leaders were against cryonics. And I think there's a perception that religious people are against cryonics, and I don't think that's true. Uh, I come from a religious upbringing, as I said, and it seems pretty clear to me that biblically we were supposed to be immortal. Not only that, but it's stated very clearly in the Bible that the heaven is the heaven of God and the earth he gave to people. We have to do things on earth. We were given great gifts and abilities, and we have to use those. It's, it's counter to religious belief, I think, to squander those gifts. Muhammad Ali, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Things have changed since I've been involved with cryonics 40 years ago, and certainly since our founder, Robert Ettinger, first proposed the idea of cryonics. You know, then people thought I was crazy. Today, people think it will work, but it's not for them. Um, Mr. Ettinger was right, I think, when he said several years ago that we have the wind in our sails. But how long will it take for cryonics to succeed? And is there a better way to help it happen sooner? And do some good for the world along the way. The Society for Cryobiology historically has been anti-cryonics. Now, for the first time, they allow cryonicists to be members, which is a really huge jump and, and feat. Um, it, we're really happy about that. It's very exciting. Nevertheless, you still have this circle in general that's problem, which is that the government only funds those things that people want and tell them to fund. And the TV scientists say cryonics doesn't work, so the people in general think it's not going to work, so the government won't fund it. And if there's no funding, then the scientists aren't going to talk about it. And if the scientists don't talk about it, then people think it's impossible and so on, it's just a big circle. And, and so we have very little in terms of government support of cryonics or funding or anything like that, or even in, in the, the general uh, scientific sphere. Um, Eventually, I have no doubt that cryonics will be successful, but we've been trying to squeeze a square peg into a round hole. The public may not think it's impossible anymore, but let's face it, most people are just not interested in cryonics. So it occurred to me that people are fine using cryo techniques for surgery. That's a very short-term process, likely will not lead to great breakthroughs needed for cryonics. But a few years ago, I thought to myself, what if we do something that the vast majority of people today think is important, something we really need, and something that not only will benefit cryonics research, but which is imperative to cryonics, a necessary precursor or stepping stone to the success of cryonics. And it's right there in front of our noses. I just donated $10 to the prize to help make organ transplants safer, less costly, and more available to those in need. My name is Sharita. Join me. Click on the link below to read more about the prize and to donate $10. And be sure to share this video 
with your friends and family. Thank you, Sharika. Organ transplants have been done successfully for only a handful of decades, yet we practically take them for granted. But they are difficult, expensive, and time sensitive. And though they've only been done successfully for a relatively short period of time, in many ways, the problem is the same as it was when most people had rotary dial telephones. If a kidney is not transplanted within 36 hours, it dies. If a liver is not transplanted within 12 to 16 hours, it dies. Typically, lungs need to be transplanted in under eight hours, and a heart within six. But they are difficult, expensive, and time sensitive. And though they've only been done successfully for a relatively short period of time, in many ways, the process is the same as it was when most people had rotary diet telephones. If a kidney is not transplanted within 36 hours, it dies. If a liver is not transplanted within 12 to 16 hours, it dies. Typically, lungs need to be transplanted in under eight hours, and a heart within six. That's a very short window of time. If a heart becomes available in Los Angeles at midnight, and the recipient is asleep in Nevada, imagine those six hours. The difficulty of quickly assembling the necessary team of experts, transportation costs, preparing the patient. The people involved in this process are amazing, and they do miraculous work. But if that window could be expanded, there would be more time to prepare the team and the patient. Transportation costs would be reduced dramatically. Safety could be enhanced and more lives could be saved. One way to extend this time is to develop a reliable way to temporarily freeze an organ as we now do with sperm and to revive the organ. The organ crowd for the day so i'm going to move forward a little bit because the sound isn't so good and i'm going to give you the link right now i couldn't do this before i'm sorry it kept stopping the video when i was typing uh all right so you guys got that there we go sorry i couldn't do anything with the sound but it is right there you can watch it yourselves if you want to um the picture doesn't show the entire, doesn't tell the entire story. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Neil, for suggesting it. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, when I'm, you know, I talked to people for years about cryonics and um, one friend in particular, and she was kind of like, eh, you know, but then I mentioned this project and her eyes lit up. And, but as I said, the picture doesn't tell the full story. Lungs must be perfect. Now we need to mute. Yeah, I don't know how to mute them. We're going to have to listen to them talking, I guess. I can't. I have no way to control that. I'm sorry. We'll listen to them eating. Um, so um, the picture doesn't tell a full story. Lungs must be perfect. And that's why we lose about 80% of lungs, because we just don't have the time to test them, make sure they're perfect. You know, if you, if you don't get a good lung, you can't put a second lung in. That's it. It's once and done. Um, a, ki a kidney, yeah, possibly you could have a second or a third transplant. Lungs, no. So they have to be very, very careful. And that's why we lose so many or so many lungs in particular. Uh, but if we could deal with that issue, no one need be on a waiting list or die waiting for an organ. And with the help of some friends, and yes, I last time I didn't mention that that's Leonard Nimoy of Star Trek fame sitting there with, with us. Uh, and he's, he was a, was a supporter. Uh, so with the help of uh, some friends, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I have no way of muting the, uh, the background sound. I, I don't have control over it. I'm not the, uh, the, the host. Uh, we have the CryoPrize project, something that almost everyone thinks is important, something that is ne a necessary stepping stone to cryonics. So please spread this around and support the CryoPrize. And thanks to Leonard Nimoy. Um, this is something people are pretty comfortable with. You know, a professor in college said studies have shown that people watch the news because they feel like they're doing something about it. 
but in fact, to do something, you have to do something. Um, there's a Jewish proverb from Ethics of the Fathers, which says it's not incumbent upon you to finish the task, but neither are you free to ignore it. So I say to you, the cryo price needs your help. You know, I need your help. Uh, we have three goals. Encourage, the one that's most well known is to encourage research at small labs with a prize for success. And our prize is relatively modest, but for small labs, that's significant. Our second goal is to inform the public about things like how many donated organs we lose and that there are things that they can do to help change that. And finally, to encourage people to push their legislators to add to the $71 million that the federal government gave to organ vitrification research at four major labs a few years ago. And I think Rudy mentioned the Organ Preservation Alliance. They were really wonderful in, in getting that, uh, that money uh, out there. And, and we really need people to press their legislators to request more of that. We can help, so that way you can help make organ transplants safer, less costly, and more available. And again, our website is here, www.cryoprize.info. I had somebody the other day try and get to it. He's like, I can't find it. What, what crypto, what? I'm like, no, it's not crypto. It's cryoprize, www.cryoprize.info. Our Facebook page is uh, facebook.com forward slash cryoprize. And um, it's, it's a valiant and necessary project in its own right. And by virtue of it, we can help make cryonics a reality. So to paraphrase my friend and fellow cryonicist, Garrett Reynolds, we can't expect to revive a vitrified organism until we are able to revive a vitrified organ. Brilliant. Uh, this is not related. Uh, once again, our website and Facebook page, www.cryoprize.info. Facebook.com forward slash cryoprize. The uh, video is on that um, website. Uh, in case you didn't see it before. Feel free to call me day or night. Uh, I won't guarantee I'll answer, but I'll certainly have uh, voicemail. And uh, if we really push this project, cryonics will succeed. And likely much sooner than it would otherwise. Uh, is this just for people in the U.S.? No, no, this is not just for people in the U.S. This is a worldwide project. Um, I read a quote this morning from the, the Dalai Lama. I'm going to stop screen sharing for just a sec. There we go. Uh, I read a quote from the Dalai Lama, which, was, which is now gone. And it said, there are only two days in the year that nothing can be done. One is called yesterday and the other is called tomorrow. Today is the right day to love, believe, do, and mostly live. So, you know, a general thought. Life is hard. So especially in these difficult times, but really always. Let's try our best to help each other. Um, and I must say, uh, as to this project, uh, I'm going to put go back to the screen share, uh, if you'll give me just one second. Screen share three, and ta-da. Okay, uh, as to this project, you can make a donation. I've put in about $10,000 over the past few years. If you can do that, great. Or if you can put in $10, we'd be just as grateful. If you buy things on Amazon, there is a project program called smile.amazon.com. You are charged nothing extra, and Amazon will donate to a project of your choice, and you can donate to our project without even donating by signing up for the Immortalist Society at smile.amazon.com. And whenever you buy products at Amazon, just use the smile.amazon.com website. Very easy, and we get money. Um, you can volunteer, and I'm gonna be blunt. Uh, I'm doing too much, and I can't give this the time that it needs. And truthfully, if I don't get more help, I don't know how much longer I can do this. So, you know, I really appreciate your taking the time to listen to this especially since alternatively you would have been sitting there while they were eating dinner. <laughs> um, and I'm open to questions. Uh, and I, Oh, and Rudy, thank you very, very much. Yes. Rudy has donated in the past and is a great supporter. Uh, we really appreciate you, Rudy uh, and, and everybody. Any questions, thoughts, comments, suggestions? Anybody just want to say hi? Can you guys still hear me? I hope. 
<laughs> okay, specifically, what kind of help? Um, I need somebody to help run the Facebook page. I want to have something going up there daily or at least every couple of days. And sometimes it goes months without me being able to put anything on there. Um, I need somebody to help run the, the website. I've just actually hired a company to try to do some work with the website. Uh, I need somebody to go out and tell organizations that this prize exists. We need to contact people. We need to let them know that this is out there. Small labs. There are a bunch of small labs out there that would be, would very much like small amounts of money. Uh, current cost of organ transplants. Good question. Um, they can be upwards of 200 or $300,000. And, you know, we don't have an exact number that it could decrease, but I would guess to below $50,000, um, possibly, you know, less than that, but, you know, hospitals have crazy expenses. So I'm not sure how that that's going to work. Um, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars is not unheard of. I mean, think about how much it costs to have a helicopter take an organ from one state to another or, you know, something like that. Uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, I don't have an info package and that's something else that we could use is somebody to help put together uh, an information packet. There, I mean, you know, anybody who is a graphic artist, graphic designer, uh, and wants to do that, you know, I'd love to have somebody put it together. There are just so many things that we can do with this. And I'm only, you know, one person. And yes, uh, York at the Immortalist Society has been a great help, but he's also very limited. As I said, I've just hired a company that's going to put together some things for me. But, you know, anything like that basically comes out of my pocket. And my pocket's only so big. So um, I, I appreciate that uh, you, you, know, you can get to the legislators. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, that also is something that you could talk with the Organ Preservation Alliance about because they do a lot of lobbying of, of legislators. I know they do it you know, sort of quietly uh, because they don't want to cause a ruckus and, and you know, have people have a, you know, any kind of negative opinion. It's amazing how, how things can... Um, can sound one way when you say them and sound differently. Storage issues. Would each hospital have its own repository? Well, you know, uh, did you get my number, by the way, EJ? 877-255-1949. Uh, 877-255-1949. I'm going to share the screen again so that you could see the phone number. Um, now how do I get back to the chat? Sorry, guys. Uh, I don't know how to get back to the chat. All right, I'm going to unshare the screen so I can get back to the chat. Um, storage issues. You know, I think that that's uh, a little, uh, going a little too far forward. Uh, right now, we have to see if it works, but uh, it looks like we're just about to have Aaron speak. Uh, so uh, I think I'm finishing up. Um, <laughs> the good egg award yes <laughs> i appreciate that um any anything else guys quickly because we're about to go to the next person thanks so much thanks neil thanks for everything you do neil um neil's an amazing guy for those of you who don't know him uh, he runs the the uh, church of perpetual life in florida and just uh just an amazing guy chris thanks thanks for staying up or waking up early i presume for for this <laughs> Connie, you're not going to make a joke, Connie? Connie's wonderful, too. I've known Connie all my, almost all my life. Uh, thank you, Seattle. Okay, our next speaker is Joan Runkle, daughter of Walter Runkle, co-founder of the Chronic Society of Michigan. She's been involved in chronics uh, through her father since 1964, and currently has an apple orchard in Fowlerville, Michigan, uh, 45 plus years. Um, she's uh, grown up the Rip Van Winkle of the Van uh, Runkle Apple. And uh, she's gonna talk a little bit about some of the graphics history um, within our organization. Please welcome John Ronzo.
I'm Joan Rumpel. I'm just going to make this quick. I've got a lot of pictures. Dennis wanted me to kind of be the batter in the box, right? Yeah. So this first picture, that, uh, this is my father. He was an electronics engineer. This is from 1940. Uh, uh, and the next, go ahead and the next one. Yeah, here he worked for WWJTV in Detroit. Um, the next picture is my father and I. This is when I first was involved in crafts. Uh, I was nine years old, and my father and I had been talking about it for about four years already. Okay. Then he read this book, The Prospect of Immortality, and that was it. He looked up the author, and he lived just a few miles from us, which, of course, was Dr. Robert Ettinger. Okay. Uh, the two of them got together, and uh, they, just, they started a little lab in Detroit, but they wanted a mobile unit, so they bought this truck and made it into a cryonics vehicle. So that's Dr. Robert Ettinger right there. Next one. Yep, there's my father. This sat in our driveway for about seven or eight years <laughs> in Southfield, Michigan. So, yeah. And here's, this is the inside of the van. And you can see the equipment it has. Dr. Ettinger is there. That's where the chemicals were kept on the right there and, you know, other various things. Next. And of course, I always played the dead body. So <laughs> whenever you see a body laying here, that's me. That's me. It's a dead body. You'll notice my eyes are old, but I just noticed that yesterday. I was going through hundreds of pictures, so this was hard to narrow it down. Okay, so now that brings us up to once 1969 was when they had this van. Go ahead. There I am again, dead. Uh, and then next. Yeah. And this is 1970. My, I graduated from high school. I was senior in high school. Next. And my dad made that picture of me <laughs> in the van. The trouble with the van was they didn't have a perfusion unit in it. It had other things, you know, to keep your heart going, this and that, all the chemicals and everything, but no perfusion unit. So my father decided to build one in the garage, a mobile one. So he went to work. So the summer of 1973, he started on a filtration unit. That's what it looked like when he was finished. And this next series of slides is just all the inner parts. And you can just go through these, yeah. There's, this is how it started. There are the parts you see. This is the filtration unit. And next stop, whoop, whoop, whoop. He, needed, uh, he needed a heat exchanger. So he built this heat exchanger, and he always built things out of 100-gallon drums. <laughs> So this is the beginning of the heat exchanger. Next. And this is the bottom of the heat. This is the mechanism in the bottom of the heat exchanger. Next. And you'll see that and this, when it's flipped over, that's going to be underneath. That's going to be in the bottom. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how he built it out of this 100 gallon, this, well, I guess it was a 50 gallon, right? 50 gallon drum. Okay, next. And, and I just, you know, was showing the progress here. Go ahead. Yep. That's the inner workings in the bottom of it that he put together. And uh, so now we're up to 1973. Next. Uh, at the same time, he patented the Runkel Apple. It was an apple that he found in Lincoln Park, Michigan in 1940, and he patented it in 73. Go ahead. And that's just a patent picture, just to prove <laughs> that he really had it. So by January of 74 here, uh, he, go ahead, started to put the heat exchanger uh, together. There we go. Go ahead. Yeah. There, that's what, that's, there we go. Okay. Go ahead, these are just inners. And there he is with the actual finished perfusion machine. And this is his workshop. So now, next, here's both of them at the back of this van. <laughs> I know the pictures are great. I didn't have time to do any gyrations with Photoshop or anything. So it's just, I'm just grabbing photos. Okay, next. And that's my father. That's Walter Uncle. Is there more? Is that it? Are we done? 
I believe that's it. I think it. we're done. I yeah. That finishes oh, it. there's one. I think there's one. Yeah, there should be. I, oh. I'm going to pull it. Yeah, there should be one to fall through at the bag. There we go. There, that's fall through. And so, uh, upon the completion of this, that was put into the van. So, you know, for years they didn't have this mold unit, but once that was there, you could have that, you could start the perfusion right in there. You know, and back then they just used some kind of glycol and DMSO, and my father put it on my finger, and it, you could taste it directly on your tongue. It tastes like rotten fish, <laughs> rotten slimy fish. Yep, and that's it. That's all. That's what yeah. Yep, I think that's it. Right. Good enough? Very good, thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, I think uh, the food's been waiting for us for a long time, and they're encouraging us uh, to take a break. And I think we're going to do that. We're going to take a little break, and that will give us the time to work on uh, some of the technical difficulties. So uh, if you guys uh, want to start uh, with the close to the world clockwise uh, fashion, or however the servers want to take like up a few time, I guess. So we'll start with that first table over there. And line up. Let's go ahead and take a break. Thank you, everyone. We'll be, and for the people on Zoom, we'll be back shortly. It's not changing for me. Hey, nice to see everyone here. Great turnout. And uh, again, uh, I've really enjoyed listening to the speakers that have been here before me. Who am I? Uh, some of you may know, some of you may not know. My name is Aaron Drake. I've been involved in this industry for a little more than a dozen years. I spent uh, the first seven years uh, working as the medical response director at Alcor. Um, I left Alcor to become an independent consultant, and I've done that for the last six years now um, uh, for a variety of companies, uh, a lot in China that I'm working with Yinfeng, who is a, a cryonics provider over in uh, uh, Asia. Uh, I've been working with Southern Cryonics and, of course, um, international cryomedicine experts or commonly referred to as ICE. Um, that's really what I'm here to talk to you about today and, and how it pertains to CI clients. Um, my objective of, of talking to you today is not to just give you a commercial on ICE and what we do. Instead, I'd really like to interject um, a dose of reality in terms of statistics that I think it's important for all of you to understand and uh, that might lead to your interest in, in ICE or some of the other ancillary services that are, are provided beyond uh, the Cranix Institute's um, uh, service. The beauty of that program that you have there is that it's, uh, I call it a la carte in the sense that you can determine how much you want to pay for services. You can pay a, a minimal amount and, um, and get the services that are provided by CI, but you can also layer on additional services on top of that. And uh, in comparison to say uh, Alcor or Yinfeng, where it's a comprehensive program, you're paying for everything, whether you get it or not, whether you need it or not, whether you want it or not. So you have a, a really well-designed business plan that allows you to add on additional things. Why are these ancillary services very important? Well, here's my dose of reality in that there, even though we talk about all the things we're doing, all the things we're hoping to do, I still there believe there's a strong percentage chance that a lot of people will get a straight freeze. Um, and I have statistics to back that up. When I first started working for Alcor prior to my starting, uh, Alcor would only have a team, a standby team, um, at the patient's bedside, member's bedside. Let's call them a member while they're still living and a patient after they've died. They would only be at the member's uh, bedside at a hospital, at a hospice, at a home, 23% of the time. Okay. Now, during my tenure, we implemented a lot of new programs. I mean, full dedicated standby teams, uh, you know, reviewing patients. We were able to get that number up to 90% at one point, but that's very hard to maintain. Uh, I think Marta, if she's online, uh, she has done some great uh, uh, compilation of statistics over the years that have uh, really shown uh, well, a variety of things, but among those, 
what are the chances of you getting a straight freeze? Uh, what are the chances of, of you getting that perfusion? And um, they're, still, they're still very high. And one of the biggest challenges is not that we don't have teams out there. I mean, we have suspended animation to choose from. We have ICE. Uh, we have Cryonics UK. We've now got some more teams in Europe. Uh, I believe there's a, a, an organization in, in Canada that can provide these. So now we have a variety of, of teams out there that are being able to provide these services. And yet the risk is not now that having a team at your bedside before you pass, but actually getting back to your cryonic service provider to have that cryoprotective perfusion performed within the limited amount of time that you have uh, after legal death, after cardiac arrest. Um, Alcor has about a 24 hour time limit. I think CI, you can correct me if I'm wrong, at one point it was 72 hours. I think that's been cut down even less to 36 hours. It is not easy to get someone back to CI's facility in that short amount of time to receive a quality cryoprotective perfusion. And it's not a cutoff where, okay, we've got this time frame, we had to hit this deadline. The sooner the better is really the key to making this happen. So um, why is this? Well, the, the funeral uh, regulations on transporting a patient across state lines vary from state to state, uh, county to county. All health departments are different in the way they handle that paperwork. And at nighttime, you can't get paperwork. On the weekend, holidays, you can't get paperwork. It's very hard. So unless you die at the proper time in the right city with the right people there, the chances of you getting a straight freeze are quite high, unfortunately. So with that in mind, I think the thing that we've done when we've designed the, the ICE program, the International Cryomedicine Experts Program, is rather than requiring the, the individual to go from wherever they are, Poughkeepsie, Los Angeles, Seattle, instead of requiring them to fly to the Cryonics Institute in, in Michigan to get the cryoprotective uh, procedure, why not bring the cryoprotective procedure to them? Now we can cut down on all the, uh, the time that occurs from clinical death to the time they get the, the procedure or arrive in Michigan. We can sidestep or eliminate all of the uh, transport and regulatory uh, challenges that we face in getting a person there. So here's what ICE is, is trying to do. Obviously, we have we have teams. We have um, more than a dozen paramedics. We have nurses. Uh, we now have a, a physician assistant on our team, and they're spread all around the country, and they can quickly descend upon a particular city where there's a need. Um, we can provide the standby stabilization and transport component. That's been around for a long time. Suspended animation, other organizations all provide that. The, the difference that we're really trying to make is by having the surgery component, by having the perfusion component, and bringing that to the patient's bedside, we can now provide that aspect there. So when it comes to CI members, we will take along the uh, CI's VM1, which is the perfusate. Uh, we'll do a, a gravity perfusion system, and we will... Uh, uh, well, you don't vitrify until they actually get cold, but we're going to prepare to vitrify that patient, perform the cryoprotective surgery, introduce the chemicals, and then place the, the patient on dry ice and get them cool very, very rapidly. Um, this allows as much time as you need to get the patient from point A to point B to get them back there. So um, I think it's a very important component, and I, I imagine that this is probably where the industry will be heading, and maybe more uh, standby teams and organizations may be going towards this model at some point in the future. I hope so, because to me, I've done 91 cases now. Uh, our team has experience in more than 120 cases and um, I will tell you the biggest challenge is the logistical challenge of getting the patient back 
to the Cryonics organization for that surgery, for that perfusion. By getting ahead of that and doing it at the patient's bedside, by doing it at the hospital, the hospice, the mortuary, their home, wherever it may be, that eliminates that entire problem. Your percentage chances we talked about at the beginning of a patient having a straight freeze to getting a quality of preservation go way, 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 way up. Okay. Um, we, we do have a, a, a website, cryomedics.org. Uh, you can look there. You'll find information about uh, who we are, what we do. Um, we have a variety of prices. We can provide just uh, remote consulting for transporting a patient. We can provide standby stabilization and, and uh, uh, transport. We can also provide that cryoprotective uh, component with the surgery and the perfusion. To me, I think that's a game changer. I think people are really uh, what's probably the best thing out there in the market. That's the beauty of your plan with, with CI is that if you decide you want to add these services on to their basic program, you certainly can. So um, anyway, that's what I want to talk about today just briefly. Let's see if there's any questions in the chat area. Maybe, maybe not. Why is oh, what ICE is doing field washout and actually putting the perfusion solution in the field? Yeah, really. Thanks for, for pointing that out. Um, you know, that, that's essentially what we're trying to do. I'm going to let Dennis know that we're wrapping up. Uh, Aaron, can you yeah, hear me? I can. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to point out that, you know, what you said about the a la carte services at CI, that really was our original intention, hmm. was to allow people to not only take responsibility, but to have the ability to use services like yours. Uh, and, um, and it's very important that people who are members take on that responsibility if they're going to be members of CI and know that they have to decide what they want to do for themselves. They can hire you to do it. They can do it themselves. Or maybe it won't happen. But they've got to do something if they want it to happen. Very important. Oh, yeah, I, I couldn't be more in agreement with you. I've been a big advocate that this is a partnership. You know, most people have the expectation that they've signed up for membership with, with whatever organization it is. They paid their money or they purchased their life insurance policy, and they just expect that now they're going to get a really high quality prior preservation. My job at Alcor was to continually monitor our, the, the patients or the members who were ill or had medical procedures. And, and even that was tough to make sure that they had a patient at their bedside. This is a partnership. You have to take an active role as a member. You have to let your chronic service provider know exactly uh, how you're doing who are your contact people? Who are your advocates? Um, if you've moved, if you change health issues, this goes to another level when you're hiring suspended animation, when you're hiring ICE, when you're expecting Chronics UK to be now become involved. Don't think that this is just automatically going to happen. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. This is truly a, a, a partnership in helping to ensure that this is going to, this is going to happen. Um, I, I, want to, I want to make it clear as, as a, a CI director, having said something that I didn't mean they had to hire you or do it themselves. There are several different choices out there, yes. but they have to make a choice and, and do something uh, or nothing will happen. Yeah. I see Michael Gill asked a question about suspended animation. Um, I, I, I don't represent them. So I, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a quick answer in that. Um, do they do perfusion? Well, you have to define which perfusion. Suspended animation does provide a service where they will do a full blood washout, basically an exsanuation, remove the blood. They put in, they do perfuse a cold organ preservation solution. Uh, it's chilled, so it does get you cool. It buys you a little additional time to get to your service organization. So now you're cooler, your organs and, and your vascular system are protected a little bit better, uh, but you still have to get to your chronic service organization within that amount of time. And uh, that's, the, that's what my point was today is it doesn't matter which organization is handling in it, whether it be ICE, SA, Chronics UK or someone else, the deadline still exists. And so I think the ICE model of doing the cryoprotective perfusion on site is better than uh, doing the 
organ preservation solution component and then hoping that you arrive in time. Uh, let's see what other questions do we have. Dennis, if you need to interrupt me to continue on, you're welcome to. I'm just kind of going through. Um, how soon can we expect uh, contracts in place where CI members can opt for ICE services? Hey, great question. Uh, and, and good to hear from you, Naraj. I, I appreciate that. Um, I think that that's something we're working on with Dennis. We've had those discussions lately. I wanted to make sure that our, our business model was in place and was working well. Obviously, we've had a few years now to, to demonstrate that we're, we're capable and that we can consistently perform. We've done many crowd preservations here in the last few years, and I think we're probably going to have uh, some similar options on CI's website like you currently have with SA. So you'll have a variety of things to, to choose from. Um, let's see, any other questions? Could I do one in Colombia? Well, so we do provide uh, services not only domestically, but also internationally. Uh, I've got a tremendous amount of experience on doing these uh, around the globe and international cryomedicine experts. Hopefully that, that first word in our name is what is uh, <clears throat> kind of the underlying point of, of where we provide services. Suspended animation currently is just um, domestic and the lower 48, not including Alaska or Hawaii. And, and um, they don't do postmortem um, and they, uh, they don't do Canada, of course. So we really try to accommodate everything we can. Obviously, there are some COVID restrictions makes it a little bit more challenging right now. But even that, we've been able to do quite a few cases lately internationally. And so we've been very pleased with those results. So uh, pricing is similar to suspended animation. Yes, we do have a variety of prices depending on what you're looking at. Again, we kind of have a little bit of a menu of choices, just like CI makes it where it's a la carte as well. We have the same kind of format. So, um, well, anyway, you, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, you can reach me at Aaron at cryomedics.org. Um, and uh, be happy to answer any other questions you might have. I don't want to take up too much, too much more time for the CI meeting. So I'm going to let you uh, turn it over to Dennis now. So thanks, everybody. Good to see everybody virtually. And I plan on being there in person next year at the meeting. So I hope to see you all then. Bye. Important things. Um, you signed up for crafts. You know, what are your next steps? What do you do? Um, a lot of people sign up for crafts and they don't fill out the rest of their paperwork. So you got to become a fully funded member through life insurance, and or you can make easy prepayments to the crafts. If you wait till you get if you get term life and you don't invest the difference, you wait till you're older. It might be too late, it might be not insurable, but now the insurance will be too expensive. So uh, get your funding right away. Um, then uh, fill out all the paperwork properly. If you're unsure if your paperwork's filled out properly, you can contact Kristen or Andy, or you can email us at info at grants.org. Make sure it's info at grants.org because all the other uh, emails out there, a lot of them are scams and scams. You keep warning people, make sure you know exactly what email, and you can always call us to if you're not sure, just on the official website. Uh, keep these guys kind of informed on a regular basis, a year year basis, so that they know that you're fully you're funded, 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 and if anything any changes in our health status, uh, please, please uh, uh, there's, there's no way to Oh, as a member, there's no way we can know everything that's happening in everyone's life. It's all to you to be and contact us. Your family, friends, friends, you can't be too used to let them know. They're going to let them know. Their original wishes, they don't need to set up their own state in such a way that their parents can set up in the right place. If you have a doctor, you're a little bit you can do that. You don't have to convince them of crying on yourself. You just have to convince them to honor your wishes. And that's the only way to do it. You can do that. 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 You can
Is there a joining? Is there a joining? Stand by local. Stand by or supporting. Uh, or supporting. Uh, 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 support some that nation supporting. If there is no local group, yeah. suck them. Donate time. Donate time. Donate, donate, time. donate, 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 time. donate this money. Is proactive. This is a proactive type of thing. We're all in this together. We're all in this together. Always worry about the crack. Always worry about the crack. It's very slick. We have a law on ID card. We have a law on ID card. We have a file of life. You put it in the car, in your glove box, in your car. Uh, on the refrigerator, as a refrigerator magnet, you can put a sticker on the front of your, your house that lets the car or emergency workers know that these are your wishes. So at least that someone is notified. Because even with the fanciest ICE and SA standby or Chronics UK, if you're not notifying the Chronics service providers or the standby groups, you're not going to get any help. Like everyone, you, you have to understand that time matters. Just like a regular 911 or CPR or anything like that, time matters. So, uh, wearing your bracelet and having your wallet ID cards, all these things, notifying your friends and family, uh, even if sometimes it's awkward, you know, you gotta let people know. You can't be reclusive about this, otherwise, your wishes won't be carried out. Um, don't procrastinate. Don't cry or procrastinate as you will. Grandma would say, ah, this is something good idea. You know, I'll sign up later. I'll, I'll get around to it. You know, it's just not always the most pleasant thing to fill out wills and stuff like that, but that's it's an important thing to do. So uh, get involved. Uh, like I said, donate time and money. Uh, keep updated. Read the credits magazine. Read the newsletter. Read the web website. And uh, stay up on issues. And with that, this concludes the Cryonics Institute portion of the meeting. And that will uh, open up the last part of the Moral Society with York Porter. Uh, welcome, York Porter. Thank you, guys. I have a bad sense of humor, so that don't, people that don't know me are probably taking a bit some use of that. I was just glad to hear that uh, I didn't face a course and we want our money back. Uh, first, before I forget, I'd like to thank Deb Fleming for the excellent job she did last year in uh, chairing the meeting. I was tied up uh, with the fact that we had COVID and not enough x-ray techs, so I couldn't be here. And again, thanks to, uh, to Debbie for her outstanding effort. Uh, one of the things in general that pops in my head, and our former president of Vendust is here, Dennis is here. Uh, I think we all round of applause. The, the hard work that goes on at CI is, is done in large measure by the board members. They have a very thankless job and they spend a lot of time and a lot of effort. I go back to over 30 years ago when we literally had one patient in a very small lab across town. and. Uh, it was magnificent to see the facility today. Every time I come out, things are better. So I'm sorry I didn't care around the applause for all the folks that have been involved with CI. <laughs> and I get some housekeeping chores, so to speak, behind us. We'll have uh, the Secretary's report followed by the Treasury report. So, Royce, I guess we'll uh, let you uh, speak up loud and Go through it for us. Okay. In a minute, like 2020, you need to go in place. I'm sorry. Hand in the microphone. Oh. Wow. We're high tech. There you go. Oh, that's the one you need. Entry goes back. In 2020, due to COVID situation, the Moral Society meeting was held electronically using Zoom software. In the absence of the Moral Society, have somewhat different roles, with CI being the involvement in direct crimes procedures and all other things, and I am concentrating on research and education. The information was given on advanced neurobiosciences, which 
There's a company that acts as a contractor that does the research in the field of crime. It was noted during the ISV that the research effort is a joint one involving the American Cryonic Society and the Immortal Society. The use of Long Life Magazine and the website the Immortal Society were mentioned uh, as well. Thanks was given to folks who would have contributed to IS research. The motion was made of ongoing IS project of the Cryo Prize and this school proving work and interest in organ prior preservation. In particular, Joe Kowalski was thanked for his efforts in furthering this important IS project. Thanks was given to the American Cryonic Society for his gracious financial assistance in providing copies of Long Life magazine to numerous readers. It was then mentioned that due to the COVID virus and the particular format of the Zoom virtual meeting that necessarily ensued, we were unable to take nominations from the floor or vote on them. And because of that, therefore, the present officers would continue to serve in their various capacities until December 31st, 2021. It was further noted, however, that if someone wishes to make a nomination, nominations by email would be accepted for seven days. And that if that occurred, a vote by mail ballot or by other electronic means or email would be held. And then the meeting was adjourned. Thank you, Russ. Correction of this is deletion. Seeing none, I'll stand to prove this red. The only reason is you've still got the microphone. We'll just let you go ahead and give the treasurer's, more of a treasurer's statement uh, for those that want to. She will indicate if you're just love to see spreadsheet, see me later, and we'll go through all the boring details of it. But at any rate, go ahead, Leonie. I'm sorry. In 2020, during the virtual meeting, though it's indicated that the Immortal Society $28,631.20 in assets which were both current and reasonably expected. Of those assets, $15,727.68 was allocated to research. $3,629.61 for the acquired prize and $9,273.99 for the general operation. For 2021, the situation for the society is a little bit better, with total assets of $50,383.48. Of this, of this amount, $36,000, <clears throat> 253 and 92 cents is set aside to be used for the Little Government Research Program. The prior price, now stands at $5,749.38. And that leaves $8,390.18 for general operations such as printing the magazine, paying to uh, keep up the website, etc. For you financial types, that one all the core details, the IS president has a spreadsheet that you can look at for more detail. Thanks very, very much to everyone who has contributed, both large and small, to the ongoing projects of the Northern Society. Thank you. Two separate 
and distinct organizations. I mentioned that because uh, some folks, I got an email or two, some folks are still haven't quite got that correct. I had started, uh, John mentioned the Oak Rack Society of Michigan, going back to her dad and Bob, that there, Robert up there, and some other folks. Then changed his name a little later on to the Cranics Association to indicate it was more widespread than just in Michigan. And finally, you know, we wound up this now known as the Immortal Society. TI so, yeah, came along a little bit later. Both organizations are, however, very deeply uh, dedicated to uh, the concept of Cranics and the rest of it in that concept. We just take kind of slightly different tacks in it. We overlap a little bit from time to time. CI has this mission. Among other things, uh, the all important task is only to visit the facility, uh, protecting the individuals that have been placed in their hands. IS, as was mentioned, we have our goal primarily of education and research. Education, again, is in the form of Long Life Magazine. There's some copies over there, including the two most recent ones, or at least they were over there. So, you know, feel free to go and pick one up. Uh, it chronically runs late, which is primarily my fault, but uh, for the latest issue, we got it out in time to get it in the mail. For some reason, I guess it's due to the COVID situation, I mean, we've done issues work for the post office, maybe you could set some light on it. Seems like that uh, it was slowed down and there's not much that we can do about it. We checked one time on increasing the, the uh, level of mailing that we use, but it was so prohibitively expensive that we couldn't do it. So anyway, they're up there, uh, free for the taking, so help yourself. I want to mention that the president of the magazine has produced some financial help for the American Crown Society, so tip of the cap for them for their generosity. That situation won't last forever. But uh, it's been great having their uh, having their assistance. Education takes place through the IS website, which can be reached at immortalsociety.com slash immortalsociety.org, which are going to prefer. Research is carried out, as we mentioned, in partnership with the American Chronic Society. We jointly use advanced neural biosciences uh, as the actual research contract. We hope to have one of those folks here today. Uh, unfortunately, Murphy's Law reared its ugly head, and they had a previous commitment. I uh, pontificate about the work, but I probably just want to say something stupid up here, so I think it's best to hear directly from the researchers themselves. And I think more, both of them are here. Talk to them about having a PowerPoint presentation and you know, a slideshow that was uh, pre narrated, but unfortunately, they had four presentations to give today. Uh, at another location, and I didn't think of it soon enough. So again, uh, I'm leaning on next year to be here. Over the next three or four uh, months, I'm going to try to get that PowerPoint presentation at least up on the AIS website. Primarily at the moment, in a nutshell, the work that we do in research involves the uh, efforts to improve the perfusion uh, solutions that are used in chronic talk with some associated information procedures and do it in a cost-effective and relatively doable and a practical way for lack of a better term. The hope is that the goal is that a publishable paper, a paper that won't just appear in long life, but will also appear in a uh, more traditional science publication will be attained. There's no guarantee of that, of course, but that's the hope and that's part of the goal that's being driven uh, towards. The results in either case, of course, will be in long life magazine, and you can keep up with it either in print or online at the uh, IS website. For you technical folks like myself, for instance, uh, there are, I made a few copies of the last article that, that on the research that was in the uh, first issue of this year's Long Life, and I think there are four or five of those over there on the table. The uh, research, uh, one thing I like about it is purposely directed toward direct finance applications. And to some degree, as Dennis Kowalski and I discussed about cranks in general, you want to kind of start out by looking for the low hanging fruit. That is, what can you do that's more readily available to improve things and uh, see how much benefit that uh, you can get from that. Nanotechnology, for example, is a great thing. I'm enamored of it. But I think in that you're looking in terms of answer over the long term. In the meantime, you know, we have to deal with what things can we do here and now to make a difference. Every endeavor sort of starts with uh, simpler things, even in nanotechnology, even though the first is simpler, 
surprisingly, it has been developed and was reported to in Long Life magazine. It's very, very, very primitive. It's a long way. I'm sorry. Closer. 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 Okay. I didn't think anybody actually wanted to hear it, but I'll do it. Uh, even in nanotechnology, even though the first assembler was reported in Long Life magazine, it is a very, 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 very primitive device. It's nowhere near what Eric Drexler envisioned. But uh, that's the way things go sometimes. One of the pleasures I get going back south is to stop at Dayton, Ohio, at the Air Force Museum, where you can see a replica of the Wright Flyer. It's amazing that that wood fabric chains, bicycle gears, uh, has morphed to the magnificent airlines that we have today. And the same thing I think will be uh, true of uh, nanotechnology. We want to thank everybody that's contributed large and small to the research effort. We do really, really appreciate it. And without that support, we'd just be talking about doing research instead of actually doing it. Uh, thank the supporters of both of the research and the Cry Prize and uh, IS uh, efforts in general. Uh, Joe Kowalski talked earlier about the Cry Prize. We appreciate it, as Joe said, if you get in touch with him. Info. There's also some information and you can link to a short video on the Immortal Society website. Uh, for me, I think the Cryo Prize, uh, which is worthy in its own right, is kind of a multi-approach uh, to the problem of cryonics. You have the cryobiologists working in from one direction. You have efforts like A and B's research and other research uh, work working from another direction in a nanotechnological uh, approach closing in from a third direction. Again, Joe gave some excellent uh, information on that. One little hint of something to come. Hang on, folks, we're just about there. Uh, I think it's very exciting, as I understand it, and this is something that I can get a lot of information about in probably the next 12 to 24 months, perhaps somewhat longer. There'll be an attempt by someone who is very qualified to write about nanotechnology and, uh, and cryonics. I uh, don't know if that will come to fruition, but I do view it if it does happen. Uh, it's a very important thing. My friend Robert Edinger did a great job with his seminal work in pointing out the evidence for cranks decades ago. The evidence has only gotten stronger down through the decades since he wrote it. To me, it's interesting to note, and this uh, kind of took me aback when I first came across it, that both Dr. Ralph Merkel and Dr. Eric Drexler were world-class experts in the field of nanotechnology have indicated that when they first thought about cryonics in general, they didn't think much of it. Uh, Dr. Drexler in particular thought something along the lines of, well, it's an interesting concept, uh, but it'll probably never work and these cryonics must be a little bit crazy. After he began developing the field of nanotechnology, he decided that uh, not only were these cryonicists not crazy, but they knew why it would work. Uh, Robert Edinger mentions, I think you recall in his book, about quote unquote giant surgical machines working with necessary molecule by molecule. Turns out that Bob, uh, who was one of the finest and most intelligent persons that I've ever known, was proud to call him a friend. He was wrong at the end of the scale, the size of the scale, in terms of the machine side, but the idea was there. Both Merkel and Drexel, Drexler, after they sat down and analyzed it in a cold, cool, analytic way, became convinced that cryonics was indeed workable. And as uh, we all know, it is a very, very rational thing to do. Uh, from our standpoint, uh, of course, it's a very irrational thing not to do it. And uh, so at any rate, that publication may be coming out, and if it does, I hope it does, I think it will be very uh, useful to add to the evidence on behalf of cryonics. I think one of the most important things about cryonics is sort of outlined in Carl Sagan's book, Broke His Brain, in it, and again, I'm sort of paraphrasing. Uh, Sagan writes about what's the difference of believing in DNA and believing in little green men from Mars. And the answer is nothing except the evidence. If the work I mentioned does come out, I think we'll just add to the mounting pile of evidence that cryonics is the thing to do. Robert Ettinger, as I just said, was one of the most intelligent, finest persons that I've ever known. 
But more importantly than that, though, he was dead right. And his advocacy for crimes and the evidence is what counts. Moving on to some other stuff, uh, we're just about done, I promise. Any old business come before the society? Any new business come before the society? All right, we're now ready for the final PA series response. The fat lady has some son, but the fat boy is just about finished. As a follow-up, uh, oh, one other thing I want to mention real quick, as a follow-up to the Secretary's report, there were no nominations received by email, so there was no need to hold any sort of election. And uh, we received no nominations at all. Back to the present, as we finish up the meeting, uh, note that CI elects one third of the board of directors each meeting, and then the board elects the office among themselves, and IS, a little bit different, the whole board is elected each year, and uh, you elect each individual officer, present officers, uh, Stefan Beauregard is board member at large, she is battling, I think some of you know, a very, very severe health uh, problem, our thoughts are with him. Royce Brown is our secretary, the only lady is our treasurer. Debbie Fleming is the vice president, and yours truly, good or bad, right or wrong, is the president. And uh, officers serve in IS for one year terms, which correspond with the calendar year. That is, they serve from January 1st of one year until December 31st of that same year. The present officers will be serving until December uh, 31st of 2021, anybody elected today will be serving on January the 1st, 2022. And now the moment you've all waited for the nomination for the Employee Office of President. Don't everybody speak at once. Yes. This is normally the point, I don't want to be presumptive, but somebody normally says, let's re-elect the crew, I don't care, that doesn't matter to me if we do that, but I do need some sort of motion from somebody to do something. That's why I'm going to be standing here all night. And I'm the for president. Thank you. We're going to do it one at a time, we're going to do the whole slate. Let's do the whole slate. All right, there's a motion on the floor to have the officers reserve for another year. For a second. Second. On her say aye. Both no. The ayes have it. The chair would entertain a motion now to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Yes. Over here's our second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You guys have it. We'll see you next year. Thank everybody for coming.